So I'm believing that as a church, since we put high priority upon the Word of God, that you have your Bible with you this morning. And it may be on your phone, and that's okay. But I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. And we're going to read verses 1 through 7 this morning. But before I do that, I want to go back and just give you, kind of bring you up to date. What's going on? What was going on then when Peter was writing this letter to the Christians that had been scattered throughout the provinces of modern-day Turkey and who were under intense persecution? They were under a lot of hardships and ridicule and, um, and just uh, discrimination, actually, for being a Christian. They were experiencing all kinds and all, a variety of uh, social rejection, mistreatment because of their faith in the Lord. And so Peter wrote this letter to help them and to encourage them to stand firm in their faith. This letter was written between the years of 60 and 65 AD. And if anyone understood persecution and was qualified to write this letter, it was Peter. He was beaten, he had been threatened, he had been punished, he had been jailed for preaching the word of God, and approximately one year after he wrote this letter, he was put to death by the emperor Nero. He was actually faced death. Peter understood what it took to endure hardship and to do it without getting bitter, without losing hope, and, and with endurance in the faith so that he could live a victorious life. His advice to these Christians was to trust the message of hope in Jesus Christ and to follow his example that he had set out. Even though they were looked down on with distrust by, by, with distrust by the world around them, Peter instructs them to do good in their towns, to submit to governing authorities, even those that were not very nice to them, to serve the, those over them, to love their spouses, to bless the people rather than to return evil for evil. And although this time of persecution was desperate, Peter declares to them that it was actually a time to rejoice, not to complain, not to fuss, not to get mad at God, but to rejoice. And then the, knowing that in the end, God would lead them into his eternal glory. I mean, that's the thing that we can hold on to no matter what is going on in our life, that someday soon he's coming and he will establish his kingdom and his rule. And so we can hold on and we can go through the difficulties knowing that there's hope. He says to count it a privilege to suffer for the sake of Christ as their, as their Savior, as Jesus suffered for them. He confirms that Satan is the great enemy of every Christian. But the assurance of the future return of Jesus Christ gives them the incentive to continue, to stand, to endure, and to keep on walking, not to give up, not to throw in the towel, no matter what the enemy did. We as Christians must remember that our Lord and Savior has experienced all that we have gone through, all that they've went through, and more. And we must follow his example. Peter encouraged these Christians then, and he's encouraging all of us this morning, that we must continue to live holy lives. We must continue to be kind to one another, to do good to one another, and live God-honoring lives in an unbelieving world while we declare the excellence of and the goodness of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, who called us out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. Now I want to read, I'm going to turn in my Bible too, to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. I want you to notice that this portion, this first four verses especially, is addressing the elders of the churches, of those churches that had been scattered and were established. He was, uh, he was addressing them now. He says, the elders who are among you, I exhort, I encourage. 
I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. And then the, the instructions to these elders. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, who we talked about that even in our songs this morning, Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd. So when Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd, appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. And now he shifts to, to those, all of those that aren't elders, but even includes the elders. Notice that. He says, likewise, you younger people, he's talking about younger maybe in the Lord, not necessarily young people, but younger in the Lord. Submit yourselves to your elders. And then now look what he says. It's almost like he called himself and said, yes, all of you be submissive to one another. It's not just the, it's not just the flock, it's elders, everybody's to be submissive to one another. And be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Here's what we we're singing this morning. Casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for direction. We thank you for encouragement this morning. I thank you, God, that you give the plan for the structure and the guidance for us in our lives, Lord. So God, we just bless you and I pray that your word, Lord, would cause impact in our lives this morning, that we can take from what we have read, the word of God and how we're gonna study this morning and apply it to our lives, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen. So all, although this time of persecution was desperate. Peter declares to them that it was actually a time to rejoice. So often I'm asked the question, uh, many times, I think of many in here, especially as you begin to, some of you that were new and, and didn't know and didn't understand, ask, what is the structure of the church? That's a legitimate question. What is the structure? Who's, who's in charge? In other words, how is it governed? Who makes the decisions? And who are we under? Today, I hope that I'll be able to answer some of these questions as we study the Word of God. So in 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 through 4, I might read that one more time. Let me just turn back there one more time. The elders who are among you, I exhort. I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, elders shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted you, but being an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So this portion of Peter's letter is addressed to the elders. It was the elders of the churches, of those that had been scattered and churches established in all these different provinces throughout modern day Turkey. And as you read these verses, we are reminded that Peter's view of leadership had changed over the years that he had walked with the Lord. Remember that Peter was the one of the disciples that was filled with selfish ambition and even asked the Lord, which one of them should be considered the greatest? That's a worldly trained view of leadership. That is not the biblical view of leadership. But that was Peter's you know, when he first began to follow Jesus, he, he was a fisherman. 
a businessman and just, you know, his, his view of leadership was based on what he had been taught from the world system. He was still looking at leadership from this worldly perspective and he was honestly looking for a position. I'm sure he was hoping, Peter, you're the greatest man, you're the dude. I'm going to promote you right here in front of everybody and give you a title and give you a position. Because he was looking, I think honestly, selfishly, and looking for a position within uh, the church or within uh, the, with the Lord. At this, uh, Peter was the one that selfishly rejected the reason that Christ even came as a human, which was to atone for the sin of the human race. When, when, when Jesus had just finished telling the disciples that he was going to go to Jerusalem and he was going to die, and he was going to be resurrected on the third day. Peter's going, oh, no, no, no. Not, yeah, I'm not, yeah, we're not going there. I will protect you. And it sounded, I mean, honestly, it was, it was good. I mean, in some ways, that was good. It showed Peter's love for him. But what, he didn't, what Peter didn't understand is that the reason that Jesus really came was to give his life for a ransom for many. In Matthew 16, verses 21 through 23, it says, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and he would be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside, the scripture says, and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he, the Bible says, talking about Jesus, said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Peter was focusing on, this is my friend. This is what we're here for. He's not going to go die. What are we going to do if he dies? So, you know, he, he just didn't understand. And he was seeing all of this from a worldly viewpoint than from a, a, a spiritual viewpoint. Peter was also the one that resisted Jesus from washing his feet because he really had a problem seeing a leader humble themselves and serve those he was leading. In the world, the, the, the ones serving are the ones that wash the feet of the leader. In God's kingdom, the leader washes the feet of those he serves. Jesus came as a servant right so in these first four verses of chapter 5 we can see how Peter's mind has changed how he's grown in the revelation and how from walking with the Lord he's now picked up and, and understands uh, that this is not a worldly structure that the kingdom of God works almost opposite, well, opposite of the world and it's uh, he, he just couldn't understand submission and servant leadership. So in verse 1, Peter addresses the elders, says, who are among you? And he encouraged them, so I exhort. I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. So notice there that Peter didn't address, you can see the change already in, in Peter's life. He didn't come to them right in this letter and say, Peter, I'm your apostle. I'm the one that's in charge and been with Jesus and saw the suffering and, and you need to listen to what I say and do what I tell you to do. He came saying, I'm a fellow elder. I'm just equal. I'm one among many. I'm no better than you. You're no better than me. We're just in this thing together. So we notice the change of Peter's leadership style. There you go. So he was a leader. He was an elder among equals. No one better than the other. It's important to realize that Peter was qualified to write this letter because he was a fellow elder. He was qualified to address the elders because he was an elder. And he had, he had witnessed witnessed. Jesus is suffering and was a partaker of his glory. I believe when he saw the transfiguration of our Lord. He was there when the Lord was transfigured. So this portion of chapter 5 is addressed to the elders for instruction in the leadership of the church. 
The Bible makes it clear that eldership is the basic leadership office of the church. No board of directors. If you'll notice, in, nowhere in the Bibles that talk about you should have a board of directors. It doesn't even say in the Bible, contrary to many believe, that the deacons should rule the church. There's a purpose and there is an office of the deacons and there's a purpose for it. So no deacon board is to rule the church. No national or, or regional district overseers are to rule the church. Even a lone pastor is not to rule the church. But the eldership of the church is to rule the church, the local church. In Acts 14, 23, Paul, it says, ordained elders in every church on his first missionary journey. Everywhere he went and established churches, they would put into place, they would ordain elders to oversee and manage the church. In Titus 1, 5, we read that Paul left Titus in Crete to ordain elders in every city. Every city being there was a church in every city. It wasn't like you had 15 churches like you do now, but you had one church. So they would ordain elders in every church of every city to manage the affairs of the church. In Acts 20, verses 28 through 29, Paul gives, the, gives direction to the elders, and he says, Therefore, take heed to yourselves, elders, and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Elders are overseers of the flock. He goes on to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. So you can clearly see that, the, that, that Paul sees the elders as overseers of the flock of God with the responsibility to protect the faith. They are responsible for what is taught, to protect the faith of the flock, to, to oversee, to govern, to manage, to, to make sure everything's, that the people are protected and the pastor to care for. Verse 2, elders shepherd the flock of God which is among you. Serve as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. I love how it reads in the uh, King James Version. It says, elders feed the flock of God which is among you. How do you feed them? with the word of God. So as Peter was exhorting the elders to shepherd and feed the flock, we can hear the words of Jesus almost being said to Peter when he asked uh, Peter this question. He said, Peter, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, then feed my sheep. Peter, an elder, was to feed the sheep of God. Elders, I'll mention, I'll just speak to you right now. If you love the Lord Jesus, and let me say when I'm including the elders, I'm talking to myself, because I'm an elder. Neil and Melissa are elders. Worth and Linda are elders in our church. Elders of the ark, if you love the Lord Jesus, you will love his people, and you will make sure they are fed the word of God. That is our primary responsibilities that we're feeding, we're caring for, we shepherd, we love. 2 Timothy, verse 2, 15. Paul instructs Timothy, the pastor, the teacher, the elder, that's who Timothy was, that elders must be men of the word of God that rightly divides the word of truth. Now, that's a heavy responsibility because nobody has it perfect. But, but before the Lord, we have the responsibility to study, to prepare, to teach, to, to bring what we bring before you is good and healthy and for your good. The Word is what will nourish the flock of God. It's what gives you strength. It's what gives you what you need to walk out this Christian life. And it's what keeps you coming back to the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ, for more and more. 
It's not drawing to us, to me, to the elders. It's drawing to the Lord himself. I read this and I like this. Spurgeon was addressing this group of pastors, room full of pastors, and he said to them, and remembering, we're talking about elders, because pastors are elders. His instruction and his advice to them was to taste the food, taste the food before you serve it. Bring the sheep together with good food. Prepare meals with love and feed the sheep directly. Now you think about that when you stand up. No, 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 we're not just to haphazardly try to get something together so I can throw out here this morning. I'm to carefully prepare. I think about Teresa's mom, Byrne, cooking. It was, it was her greatest gift, I guess, that she could provide. And her way of showing love was to prepare a meal for you. She wanted to make sure it was the best. Every meal was the best meal <laughs> that you could eat. She would taste it along the way to make sure it's seasoned right and make sure it's going to, you know, she was, you know, the menu was carefully thought out. She did it from a part of love because she wanted you to enjoy it. She wanted it to be good for you. She wanted it to nourish you and to just to be something special. Every meal for her was something special. That's the way it should be. Every meal that comes from this pulpit should be special. It should be carefully prepared. It should be prepared with love and concern for your well-being. And we should taste it. I, it's not something I'm standing up here. That's a hypocrite that says one thing and does another. It should be something that we have tasted ourselves. And that we have experienced. That we are applying to our life. Before we just begin to throw it out there haphazardly elders we're not just to serve up a meal without caring enough to taste and see if it is good every time that we gather in the house of God to eat from the word of God the meal should be prepared carefully with love with concern for the welfare of the people to shepherd the flock of God you must have a heart like Jesus that's willing to give one's life for the sheep. One that truly loves and one that's truly interested in those he serves. You know, it's, you know, you see so many times in ministries that all the focus is about the pastor or the whoever. But that so should, that is not right. This should come, it's a, it's a privilege, it's an honor, and it comes with great responsibility to you to serve, to prepare, to take the time to study, to invest, to know what's going on in your life, to care about what's going on in your life, to bring a word that can help you. It breaks my heart to see people struggling and going through the difficulties and, and, and going through things that maybe just where they've walked away from God in some way. That breaks my heart. It breaks my heart for those that have been a part of the church, our church, any church, and are no longer in the house of God. That breaks my heart because they're needed and they need to be here or somewhere. They need to be in the house of God. Elders. We should care. Now, I'm, I'm, this is addressed to a lot of the elders, but let me just say, it's to you, it's to everyone. Remember how he said, young people submit. Well, all of us submit. I'm saying, yeah, this is for the elders, but it's for all of us. We should all care. We should all look after one another. We should all love each other and be concerned about what's happening. If we can help, if anybody can help, share a word, pray, counsel, then we should be doing it for one another out of our love for each other. He says that elders are to, be, are to serve, serve as overseers. 
In other words, we're to be like a shepherd who loves his sheep, that watches over the flock, who protects, who cares for, and who feeds the sheep of his pasture. Not by compulsion, but willingly. Not because you have to, not because it's the obligation. I've got to teach Sunday, so, you know, I, oh Lord, I don't, have, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to do it. You know, I've got to throw something together. We don't do it by compulsion because we have to. People, shepherds, are, are to serve God and his people willingly from a heart that loves them and desires to serve them. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. In other words, the motive of our heart, of an elder's heart, and the motive of your heart, should not be for money, power, recognition, to get a position. That is not the motive to stand before you. It's not the structure of, the, of God and his kingdom. Our motive is, is love. It's an honor. It's so, you know, I know there's, again, you know, many structures and many churches that I've even sat among pastors. I hate to even say this. That the first thing they began to talk about was what they got paid and what their benefit package was and what, what other benefits they got. And uh, that should not be the motive. That should not be the reason. It shouldn't be a, just a job that you're working. It should mean more to you than, than just standing up here and letting people brag on you and hand you a paycheck. Verse 3. Nor is being lords over those entrusted to you, but being an example to the flock. Jesus' words in Matthew 20 was, Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. There's your leadership position. If you want to get promoted into that, then be a slave. Serve. Wash the feet. Lower yourself. Get some humility and realize you're not it. Elders must understand Ah, this is a biggie too. That the sheep do not belong to them. They're not ours. They're the Lord's. They belong to God. Therefore, it is the truth. I mean, how many times have you heard, this is my people, nobody better not. <laughs> These are not my people. You're not my people. I don't own you. You belong to the Lord. You're special in his sight. And it's a great responsibility to be called by God himself to serve you. Verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, we're talking about Jesus, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So the New Testament only uses the title chief shepherd when it's referring to Jesus. So there's no doubt, it's not the chief shepherd in here. It's not me. We're talking about the Lord. When the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. It's a good reminder for elders, for pastors, for teachers, for those that are in this leadership position to remind us that we're not the chief shepherd. And if one begins to think that they may be, the temptation will be to start thinking and acting like their God. The primary meaning of appears, when the chief shepherd appears, the primary meaning of appears is when Jesus makes a visible manifestation of who he is. When he comes and makes this visible manifestation of himself. So Peter is saying that when Jesus comes, at the second coming, this future event, that he will show all the glory that he possesses with the full disclosure. There'll be no doubt of who he is. This is where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. It's not that they all choose to follow him, but they have no doubt 
This is him. It's a full manifestation when he comes. It's then that Jesus will reward leaders and all true believers with an unfading crown of glory and invite them to reign with him forever and ever. Now I want to go back just a little bit and talk about us. Because the Bible makes it clear how the church is to be structured, how it's to be managed, and how it's to be organized. So first of all, we must understand that Christ is the head of the church and is its supreme authority. Jesus Christ is the head and the supreme authority. Paul says in Ephesians 1, that God put all things under Jesus' feet and he gave him to be head over all things to the church. So if there's any doubt of who's in charge, it's Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4.15, but speak in the truth in love that we would grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ. Number two, the church is to be loved, cared for, taught, protected, managed, and served by two main offices. They are elders and deacons. In the Word of God, elders are is referred to as, it's got several different names that, that carries the meaning elder. Pastors are elders. Teachers are elders. Bishops, that word means overseers, are elders. Shepherds and elders. All of those mean the same thing. They all can be listed as an elder. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. The biblical qualifications for an elder, let's go there. It can be found in Titus chapter 1, 6 through 9. You might want to turn there. This is what qualifies someone to be an elder. Titus chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 6 through 9. I love the fact, I love to hear Bible pages turn. <laughs> That's encouraging, isn't it? So we'll just take our time and wait. Titus chapter 1, and it comes from verses 6 through 9. Qualifications. It give gives us a list of qualifications for pastors, teachers, elders, bishops, overseers. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation, in other words, excess living, or insubordination, for a bishop, again, we're talking about an elder, must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Phew. <laughs> I'll be honest, that's a very intimidating list. Paul in 1 Timothy also gave qualifications for an elder. He addresses the elders as a bishop, again, knowing that a bishop is an elder, is an overseer, must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reference, not a novice, meaning not, not just real young in the Lord. You, you know, there's, there's a time of maturing and growing up and being a part, even though you can be very mature in the Lord, but there's a, uh, being a novice is you just don't take somebody that walks through the door and put them an elder. Yeah, you know, there's this time of growing, of, of learning and, and becoming, you know, to know the people and to love the people. You, you can't love people that you don't know. Having a good testimony money among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and in the snare of the devil. So qualifications for an elder and for 
church leadership. The second office is the is deacons. The word deacon is used in the Bible in the book of Acts uh, when the first 12 apostles sub summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. What they were saying is, it wasn't that they were above that, it's just the priority was that they needed to spend time in study and preparation, preparing the meal to be served to the flock. So they're saying it's not good that we would take away from that time in order to help just, you know, serve each other and to meet the needs of people. <coughs> he, so he says, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So these deacons were selected from among a large group of disciples that were willing to serve, to minister to the church's physical needs, while the elders continue to study and minister the church to the church's spiritual needs. So Paul gave a, uh, Timothy a list of qualifications for deacons in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. You may want to turn there. Qualifications for a deacon. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. <clears throat> you know, and it's not bad to really want to be a part of leadership. That's not a bad thing. But what I would just encourage you to do is to look at these lists and have the desire to begin to line our life up the best we can to this list. Deacons, you must be reverent, not double tongue, not speaking one thing one place, something else another, not given to too much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. Listen, deacons have a huge responsibility. Right there is a huge responsibility. Holding the mystery of, uh, of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also be first tested. Then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let, hus or let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves good standing and great boldness and the faith which is in Jesus Christ. I was reminded, you know, Philip was a, a deacon. Look at the boldness that he, Philip had as he went out preaching the gospel. I mean, he, it wasn't like he just was sitting in there, you know, passing the ushering plate. He did that, I'm sure. But he also was proclaimed the gospel. Did many, um, uh, uh, was martyred for his faith. So deacons are to be model servants who love, who excel in serving, and being attentive and responsive to the needs of the church. That's, and, and the thing of it is, you don't wait to go into places, these kind of positions. It says, let them first be tested. I believe that leadership appointments usually come from recognizing what you're already doing. If you're already serving, if you're already looking after the needs, and if you're already caring for one another, if you're already tending for the faith, you'll probably get recognized. So they serve the body of Christ. They serve and assist the elders. They help organize the services. They care for the needy. They protect the unity of the church. That's a big thing and guard the ministry of the word. Huge responsibility. This isn't some, you know, I can just be the hospitality committee. There's a big responsibility that goes with this office. The qualifications for leadership, deacons and elders, within the church have nothing to do with giftedness. I want you to notice that. It didn't say look for the best gifted 
business-minded person, the one with the most money, the one that has the most charisma, that can talk eloquently, that, that can do all these great things and leads people wonderfully, that isn't the, that isn't the qualifications that the Lord set in place for church leadership. Seminary does not qualify you to be an elder. I mean, most churches think if you ain't been to seminary, you ain't nothing. You can't do anything. It does not qualify you. It might, can certainly instruct you and help prepare you, but it's not what qualifies you. Being a charismatic speaker does not qualify you. Money and a successful business does not qualify you for leadership in the church. What qualifies you for leadership within the church of Jesus Christ is faithfulness, godly character, established according to the clear criteria that they listed in the Word of God, and a willingness to submit and to serve one another. That's what qualifies you. This list of qual qualifications, I don't believe requires perfection because I don't know that anybody can, can live all those things in perfection. But I do believe that it should be our goal and it should be our desire and that there should be fruit of all of those in our lives. So I think when we're considering or looking at a person that might uh, fit one of these roles, then we would look at this criteria and, 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 and try to answer the question is, does this man desire all the things that these qualifications require with his whole heart? Does he really want to line these things up? Perf uh, you know, not perfectly, but does he want to attempt to put this into action in his life? And does his desire to meet these qualifications, is there some fruit of it in his life? I mean, there should be fruit. If not, it's not time. You know, if there's some things that are really out of line or that just are not lining up, then maybe it's just to, to meet and to talk about those things and to, uh, and to uh, give them time to continue to work on those areas in their life. Another point that I want to make is that Paul instructed Titus and Timothy to select elders in every city for the leadership of the local church. <clears throat> From this, we can see that the local church is to be autonomous. That word means having the freedom from any external authority or control or interference of any individual or organization to govern itself or to control its own affairs. Now that's a big definition, but I may want to read that one more time. <clears throat> so Peter didn't say, okay, we're going to have a regional group over here that's going to tell you and your local church what you need to do and you need to preach this message on Sunday and you need to do this on Wednesday and you need that's not the structure of the church let me say it one more time I'll give you the give you the definition first of all again if I can find it the definition of an autonomous church having the freedom from any external authority we're not under some regional board of directors somewhere, control or interference of any individual or organization to govern itself or to control its own affairs. So this is why, as a church, we are a non-denominational church. You know, the first thing people want to know, and that's not something that we need to go around. This is just something that we're trying to do to line up and have been trying to do to line up the art church as best we can under a biblical structure. So it's not something we're going around trying to put other churches down for. It's just, it's just where we are. And, God, and thank God we had the opportunity, you know, to almost hit the reset button to start all over. And we're still working on it, trying to get it right, trying to get it as biblical as we possibly can. So this is why we're a non-denominational church. There's no other authority over this church other than Jesus Christ, the elders as of this church and you as the people of God that are a part of it. 
So a question is always, you know, that, that, that strikes fear almost in some of our hearts because you think the first thing that's going to come to your mind, well, then who are these people? Who are the elders accountable to? Who, who, what if somebody gets out of the line? What if I go crazy and do stupid things? What happens? Who's in charge? The elders of the art church, first of all, are accountable to the head, Jesus Christ. Secondly, we're accountable to one another. There's no, I'm up here and they're down there. We're all equal. They, the, it's referred to as the pastor, the one that, that is called to, I guess, be the ultimate head. And I still picture this whole thing as a family. You know, the husband and the wife and actually kids are all equal. I mean, it's not like one, but the way God has assigned the authority and the responsibility is that the husband is to submit to God and the wife is to submit to the husband and the children are to submit to the husband and wife. That doesn't mean that one's bigger, better, you know. It means that together we're serving the Lord. It's the same thing here. You know, as elders, I'm, I'm, even though I'm the, what they call the first among equals, I guess you could say, I, over this church, I carry the ultimate, almost like a dad, the responsibility to take the advice and to take the counsel of the elders and then make the ultimate decision prayerfully and hopefully it would all be in unison and in one accord, we'd all be in agreement. But should I get out of line or should Neil get out of line, there would be the accountability first and foremost is Jesus Christ, his word, what it says about whatever that situation is. Secondly, the elders to go, the, it's not just, see, being a pl in a place of leadership is not just a great time when everything's going great. It's fun when things are good, but it ain't as fun when things, when there's a problem. Leaders have the responsibility to handle difficult situations as well. So we can't just sweep up under the rug we have to address and be willing to go to each other and confront these things. Then not only are we responsible to one another, we're responsible to you as well. So we're responsible. The accountability is to God first and foremost, to one another as elders, and then to the people of God. You have a voice in this. It's not like there is no voice. But ultimately, decisions have to be made. That's just the structure that God has put in place. Ultimately, decisions have to be made, and it's the church leadership, the elders, that, that are required to make that, those decisions for the good of everybody. <clears throat> so thirdly, so first to Jesus Christ, second to the, uh, the accountabilities to the elders, and thirdly to the people of God that, is, that God has placed under their leadership. Peter, Peter made it clear that all, including elders, are to submit to one another. I also believe that we should all have people in our life that are mature Christians, that are mature in the Lord, that love you, that care about you, that you can trust, that meet the qualifications that we just talked about for leadership, that we can trust, that we can talk to, that we can seek counsel from, it's just healthy to have people in your life. But that doesn't mean, you know, that they're going to come in and tell you what to do and how to do and how to run the church and how to, what decisions to make. It's people you trust and you can seek counsel from. All of us should have those in our life. The key to this form of government is submission. That's the key. It's submission to God and to the leadership structure that God has set up and to one another. You know, I heard uh, somebody, I don't remember who it was, said, democracy is the finest type of government that's ever been known as long as the people are Christians. Because Christians will be willing to submit and come up under. But the world doesn't. And everybody, the world wants its own way and its own 
you know, will be willing to throw somebody out instead of come up under and wait. So verse 5, <clears throat> Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. In the first four verses of chapter 5, Peter gave specific instruction to those that would occupy this office of eldership regarding how they should lead the people of God. Now he addresses those that are younger spiritually. These are those who don't serve in the role of a deacon or an elder. Peter writes that they should submit themselves to the elders. Why is this so difficult? Why did he even bring that up, I wonder? I believe he gives the most, the biggest reason that that, that is a difficult thing and it was worth him bringing that, that up. Pride. You know, to be able to submit yourself to one another requires humility. It requires that you lay down the pride. He goes on to say all of you, including the leadership, are to be submissive. We're all to serve each other. The elders are to serve the people, and the people are to serve the elders, and we're all to serve one another. His instruction is that all of you, young and old, put ourselves in a place of humility, submitting to one another, knowing that God's natural response to pride is that he will resist the proud, but he will give grace to the humble. Peter made it clear throughout this letter that Christians are to be a people that submit to authority. He told us that we're to submit, wives submit to husbands, submit to the governing authorities in your, com in your community. Submit to the king. Submit, you know, it's total submission. We're to be a people that submit. However, we got to realize and make sure we understand, and Peter made this clear, that the ultimate authority is God and his word. And this is to take priority over all other authority. In other words, wives are to submit to husbands, but if he's leading them astray and, and going against the very word of God, they're not to submit to that. If your eldership is going against the word of God and is not, you know, is not as leading the people astray from the faith, then you're not to submit to that. God is the ultimate authority. Verse 6 and 7. Therefore humble yourselves under, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. To humble our, ourselves under the mighty hand of God is to let go of our own power and our own strength and our own abilities and surrender to God's wisdom and his purpose for our lives. He made it clear that what pride does to his people, it takes us out of the will of God. It leaves us unprotected and vulnerable to the enemy's attack. To admit to ourselves that we need the Lord, that we are in need of God, it, it requires humbling ourselves, that we can't do it all in our own power. By casting all our cares on the Lord is to throw them far from us into the hands of a God that's more than able to, to handle it. Believing that God will take care of every situation in our lives is humility. Because we're giving that difficult, scary situation to God and admitting to him and to ourselves that we need him and we need his wisdom and we need his direction. That means that we must let God have con full control of what's happening in our life. When it happens, and accept his timing in all things, knowing and allowing him to work it all out according to his plan and is on his purpose. As we wait on the Lord, he promises that he will lift us up in due time. We are to simply choose to trust him with the outcome, with the situation, with everything that's going on, to trust him with the timing, to submit to his supreme wisdom and authority, knowing that he cares, truly cares and loves us, and everything that he does will be for our good, and to draw us closer and closer to him. 
So that concludes that portion of our study, <clears throat> verses 1 through 7. And I just want to pray just for a second. And then, so just be thinking real quick. Maybe you can give me some thoughts. Some, something that maybe you received, some eternal truth that you got from this this morning. And how you can apply this to your life. Because that is my goal from here on out, that not only we just don't come in here and see it and listen, but I want this to be a meal that you can take and, and that it will help you and to grow and to be good for you and to nourish you and to guide you. So, Father, right now, we just come before you humbly, Lord, and uh, recognizing the privilege that we all have for serving you, Lord, for serving one another and for submitting ourselves to all the authorities in our life. God, this is not as easy as these scriptures sound. It's very difficult to apply this into our lives. It's difficult because of how we've grown up in an American system and a worldly culture that uh, really does not, is not willing. We, we value independence. It seems like we want to be our own. We don't want to submit to nobody. We just want to do our own thing and be our own boss and do what we want to do. But God, I pray for myself, for the elders of this church, for the deacons of this church, for the body of Christ, that we would be willing to take your word, God, and apply it to our lives. That we would be willing, out of love, to serve one another, to lower ourselves, to, to wash one another's feet, God. That no one, Lord, in this house would ever think they're above or better than somebody else or above reproach or above correction. God, that we would humble ourselves, each and every one of us, and submit just like you've told us to do, God. And Lord, help us to understand and realize your ways aren't our ways and your thoughts aren't our thoughts. You understand what is best. And even though it hurts and even though it tests our flesh and our worldly wisdom, God, help us to lay it down and to cast it all far from us in the mighty name of Jesus.